We're going to switch gears a little bit today and perform a lab where we're trying to find a relationship between the radius of an object's path as it goes around in a circle and the speed at which it travels as it goes around the circle. Radius and speed. Now, there's a whole bunch of variables that are in play here when we're talking about an object moving in a circle. Two of them are r and v. Take a look at this equation. f is equal to mv squared over r. That's the basic equation that describes what's going on, right? v and r are certainly related to each other. We want to find out what the re that relationship looks like. So, the problem will be, in the form of a question, for an object moving with uniform circular motion, which is what you're going to do with this object that's going to be spinning around, make it go at a constant speed, what relationship exists between the radius of its path and its speed? Now, we have to identify variables for this and all our other activities. There is a manipulated variable and a responding variable and then a whole bunch of control variables. Based on this problem, okay, read the problem again, internalize it, and then tell me what the manipulated variable is. What are we going to change in this activity? Who's got that? Eric? Yeah, we're going to change the radius of the circle. Okay, the problem is, what's the relationship between radius and its speed? The manipulated variable is the radius of the circle. Now, I'm not going to tell you what the responding variable is, but I don't think it takes rocket science to figure out what the responding variable is, given what I just told you and given what Merrick just told you. The manipulated variable is the radius. The responding is fairly obvious, I think, when you read your problem and know that the manipulated is the radius. And the control variables are everything else. You're going to come up with some good control variables as well. There's a couple that are really important that you don't want to miss. Now, for the first time, we're going to identify a hypothesis for this one. Hypotheses should be phrased in the form of an if-then statement. If dot dot dot, then dot dot dot. What comes in the first dot dot dot? What should I put in there? Always. What always comes after if? Good. The manipulated variable. If the radius does this, if the radius increases, if the radius decreases, if the radius whatever, okay, you're changing the radius. You want to see what effect the radius changing has on something else. Well, then, if the radius does this, then what goes in the second blank? What is it? The responding variable. If the radius does blank, then the whatever the responding variable is, does blank. Now, remember, the hypothesis isn't a complete guess. It is, to some degree, a guess, but it's your best estimated, an educated guess, not just a, a random guess. Okay, I don't want you to just say, if blah, 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 eh, whatever, I'll just put this whatever, because I'll get credit for it. Okay, give it some thought. Okay, try to identify, um, try to nail that hypothesis. Try to have a conclusion that says, I accept my hypothesis. Okay, if in the end it doesn't work out, that's okay. But I want you to try that. Don't just guess. Okay, educate a guess. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, but we free... No, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Merrick said, for the manipulated variable, couldn't you also use speed because they're related to each other? Yes, they are related to each other. In fact, the manipulated variable and the responding variable will always be related to each other. Okay, I just gave you a little hint there, another hint. Okay, the manipulated and responding variable will always be related to each other. But when we phrase a problem like this, what's the relationship between the radius and speed? Then we're going to identify that manipulated variable first. And that's what we're going to end up changing. Could you do this activity conceivably where you change, where you manipulate the speed? Possibly, but that's not what we're going to do. We're going to manipulate R and then see how V responds to that. Another hint. What comes next? Well, I've got the procedure listed here, but really it's materials. The materials are basically what you see here under procedure on the board. Um, you've got a, a, a PVC tube, a hollow tube, we'll call it. That hollow tube is not going to be connected to anything. 
Rather, it's going to have a string that goes down through it, not connected, just goes down through it and is free to move. On one end of the string, you're going to have a mass. That mass is going to be a 100 gram mass, a 100 gram steel mass. On the other end of it, you're going to have a rubber stopper. Doesn't matter what that weighs. You're going to need to measure distance, so you're going to need a meter stick. And you're also going to need to measure time. So you're going to need a stopwatch or an iPhone or something to measure time. So in addition to what you see up here, you're going to need a meter stick. You're going to need something to measure the time. Now, what are we actually going to do in this activity? You're going to set up the apparatus like this, and then you're going to end up swinging it. Now, uh, what do I, how is that going to find us a, a radius and a, and a, and a period and a, and a speed and a centripetal force? and so on and so on and so on. Well, first, before you actually spin it, you're going to measure off distances. Okay, you're going to measure off uh, distances from the rubber stopper. So from the middle of the rubber stopper, although it may be difficult to measure from the exact middle of the rubber stopper, do you hear what I said? It may be difficult to measure exactly from the middle of the rubber stopper. Do your best. Measure 20 centimeters from the rubber stopper. 30 centimeters from the rubber stopper, 40, 50, and 60 centimeters from the rubber stopper, all the way from 20 through 60 centimeters from the rubber stopper, and mark that on your string. If it's not already marked, mark it on your string. If it is already marked, double check the distances to make sure that somebody in the last class didn't mess up on those measurements, okay? Swing this around. As you swing it around faster and faster and faster, the rubber stopper is going to go out further and further and further from the center. In other words, the radius will be bigger. What you want to do is swing it around so that in each trial, the radius is either 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 centimeters. And now that might mean that you have to, oh, slow it down. Maybe you have to speed it up. You want to... Um, Swing this thing around such that the radius remains in one trial at 20 centimeters. Then in the next trial, it remains at 30. And then in the next trial, it remains at 40, and so on. Does that make some sense? That's going to take some practice. You're going to be in groups of four. First person might not be able to do it. Okay, first person might get frustrated, swing it around. I can't keep it at 20 centimeters. It keeps going bigger. Then it keeps going smaller. I can't do it and pass it on to the next person. Somebody in your group will be able to do it. Okay? Always there's somebody that's able, to, that's able to do that. But with everyone, it takes a little bit of practice because what you're going to find is that you're going too fast, the radius gets bigger, you go too slow, the radius gets smaller. You want to keep the radius the same in each trial. Then go from to the next trial, increase the radius in the next trial, so on. Make sense? So as you're spinning it around here, you've got the radius measured. That's the manipulated variable. What responds to that? Well, we talked about that a little bit, the speed. The speed responds to that. How do you measure speed? Well, you're not going to measure directly. What you're going to measure is the, the number of revolutions that it makes and the time that it takes for that number of revolutions. Specifically, how long does it take to make 20 revolutions? Let's say the radius is 0 0.20 meters. It takes this many seconds to make 20 revolutions. Well, you know what? Once you've done that, do it again. Get the time for 20 revolutions twice. Then increase your radius to 0 0.30 meters. Get another time for that. Get another time for that. And then so on. Then I want you to fill in your analysis table. Your analysis table will likely include your data table. Notice... I've got a data table there that doesn't include any calculations, just data. You need to have that separate from your analysis table. Then, when you go and do your analysis table, it may or may not include your data table. That's, it's not a huge deal whether it includes what you've already written down or not. If it does, that's fine. If it doesn't include what's in red, that's fine because you've already got that into your data. What it does need to include, for sure, is this, what's circled in green. The average time, the period, and the speed. The average time
labeling the columns here A through F. The average time will be column B plus C divided by 2. So if column B, which is time 1, was 18 seconds, column C was 20 seconds, then the average time would be 20 plus 18 divided by 2 is 19 seconds. Time 1 plus time 2 divided by 2. The period is going to be what? Well, it's going to be the time, which is column D. What am I going to do? Divide it by, somebody said it? Whatever we get here for the average time for 20 revolutions, divide it by 20, and then we've got the time for one revolution, the period. And then finally, speed is going to be 2 times pi times r, which is column A, divided by the period, which is column E. If it was me, I would put all this data that you see circled in red there into a spreadsheet, and then have the spreadsheet spit all this stuff out for you. Enter a formula for this, this, and this, and then just drag those formulas down and have Google Sheets calculate that for you. It's up to you. If you want to do that by hand, that's fine. Okay, but the spreadsheet can do it a lot more quickly and efficiently for you. Now, once you got that, hey, there's some analysis questions. The good news is most of these analysis questions are already answered. I've got two specifically circled here, five and six. The only reason I've circled those two is because, really, except for those two, the answers to the rest of them are somewhere in the lab already. For instance, question number one, average the two times out. Well, we've already done that in our table. Get the period. We've already done that in our table. Okay, get the speed. We've already done that in our table. The only thing that you need to address really at this point, because you haven't already addressed it, is question five and six. Identify the force that caused the centripetal force. Remember, we talked about a car going around a turn. Centripetal force is caused by friction. Sometimes it's caused by friction. Um, the Earth going around the sun, centripetal force is caused by gravity. The electron going around the nucleus, the centripetal force is caused by an electric force. But here, the centripetal force is caused by something. You need to identify what it is and then find its value in question number five. And in question number six, the only other thing that you need to do really separate is to plot a graph. It shouldn't be velocity versus radius, though. It should be... We're close, but what is it? Speed versus radius. Good. Plot a graph of V versus R. Maybe it looks like this. Okay, maybe it looks like this. Maybe it looks like this. Maybe it looks like this. Whatever. Ultimately, your conclusion will be based on whatever graph you get. Now, first time we're writing a conclusion when we have a hypothesis. How do you do that? How do you relate the conclusion to the hypothesis? We always start off by repeating the hypothesis, right? This was your hypothesis. Repeat that in your conclusion. And then, what do you say after that? Next sentence always starts off the same. Yes, you accept the hypothesis or you reject the hypothesis. And then tell me why. Basically, you know, number... The conclusion in the labs we've done so far without a hypothesis have all related back to the problem. And then we've said, you know, this is what we learned, this is how we know. We're kind of saying the same thing, except we're relating it back to the hypothesis, which in turn relates back to the problem. This time we're accepting or rejecting the hypothesis, and then basically, how do you know? All right? So conclusion. Restate the hypothesis. Accept or reject that hypothesis based on what you see in your analysis. And then, how do you know? Basically, why are you accepting or rejecting the hypothesis? Finally, the last thing is sources of error, right? Two or three good sources of error and suggestions for improvement. One thing that I've noticed. Uh, this semester, more than any other semester I think that I've taught, not just you guys, but other classes that I've taught as well, 
There's been a few times when people have identified a good source of air before they've even started the activity. And then they've said either, oh, perfect, I could fix this, or they've said, you know what, I'm just going to kind of leave this because I want a good source of air. I want to be able to identify a good source of air. Listen, if you identify something that can be improved upon before you start, fix it. That doesn't take away a source of air. I'm perfectly okay with you identifying that as a source of error and then telling me not how you're going to fix it next time, but rather how you already fixed it. That's even better, isn't it? Than telling me how you're going to fix it next time, telling me how you fixed it. So don't leave something and do a lab poorly because you want to have a good source of error. Okay. Fix it and tell me how you fixed it. Okay. That's just as good or even better than telling me how you're going to fix it next time. What do you got to hand in for this one? We need a problem. We need variables. We need hypothesis for the first time. We need materials. We do not need procedure. The procedure is written out for you on the handout that I gave you. And I think that's pretty clear. I think it becomes redundant in kind of a make-work project if I have you write that out again. So you don't need to write out the procedure. But you do need data, of course. You need analysis, which includes the table. It includes a graph and the answers to a couple questions. You need conclusion. And you need sources of error.